Recently, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was labeled the most diverse faith group in the United States of America. Yet I do believe that when we look at our historical attitudes toward music, then we've been less than faithful to our calling to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. And whilst we can raise our hands and say, isn't it a wonderful thing that we are considered so diverse? I'd like to challenge that maybe in our musical thinking, we've been anything but. Indeed, probably we've been the enemy of diversity. You may agree, you may disagree, but at least let's talk. My name is Ken Burton. Warm Christian greetings and Maranatha. I'm going to be speaking today about a topic which I believe needs to now be spoken about properly by the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church whilst we're now examining our historical attitudes toward race relations and equality. I'm speaking about the attitudes toward music which have been prevalent in the Adventist Church. Now there are many attitudes but I'm sure if you're watching this you would agree with me that there is an attitude which speaks louder or more prominently than others even though we have a diversity of approaches around the world. It's an attitude which we find around the world. It's an attitude which I find in many conversations that I have on Facebook when I'm dealing with cultures from around the world in Adventist forums. And this attitude I submit to you very openly and honestly, and I would love you to listen and be patient, even though I may be using words which you may find might be, in your view, inflammatory or inappropriate but I'm going to say it because we have to tackle this we have to tackle this honestly and openly I will submit to you right now that the attitudes that I have seen over the years over my 50 years which God has blessed me with in the planet earth as being a Seventh-day Adventist part of a church which I so deeply respect and love the teachings which we find on the internet in seminars and presentations and I have full respect and love for those who present them as brothers or sisters in the faith no doubt that they are being sincere yet I believe that they are saying what they understand but not realizing that what they are teaching, which they feel is somehow truth, is actually rooted, without their knowing it, in an ideology which is fundamentally built on racism. Racism is the foundation behind many of the attitudes that have been perpetuated throughout the decades in Adventist music and Adventist music teaching. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to address that first and foremost so that you can see, because I find a lot when statements like this are made, people are like, what are you talking about? But when you now start to unravel and, and speak about it, they, they, they start to, to, to see why you are saying what you are saying. Then there's a realization Ah, there's that ah moment. Ah, get it now. I see. Because what we've got to understand is that this idea of racism, and a lot of people don't like this word racism or being called racist because racist means I hate people and I don't hate people. It doesn't mean that you necessarily hate people. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't have to manifest itself necessarily in hatred. That's racial hatred. There is, for me, a much more subtle way of dealing with 
other cultures where at its root the mindset is that that culture is higher or lower that was at the root of the colonial system which the country where I live in ran for a couple of hundred years where a quarter of the world was under British control and what we're taught a lot is all the benefits that were brought and the gospel that was brought to Africa even though it was actually in Africa a thousand years before it started to spread on mass in Europe but the benefits of the the roads which were built or the railways which were built in India the same railways which were used to transport the riches out of the country but it was possible to have that coexistence of bringing a benefit to a country whilst considering the inhabitants of that country inferior that was the philosophy that was the very foundation behind colonialism and even the transatlantic slave trade well certainly the the latter part of the transatlantic slave trade where you had scientists coming out saying we have scientific proof scientific evidence that along the evolutionary trajectory there are certain cultures who are up there and have attained full human status and full intellectual status there are some who are a little lower not quite intellectual but there are some i.e. the black race who are not even at the level where they can be considered fully human beings therefore they can be treated like animals they can be treated like property and indeed they were because the science or the pseudoscience said so to be fair not everybody believed that not everybody bought into that lie but some people conveniently believed it to justify their expeditions be they missionary expeditions or exploring but they used that to suggest that the natives of the countries that they went to were inferior and they made that known that we are the superior race they are the inferior they are wild they are savages they are beasts they are unintellectual they are unintelligent and need us to show them the way so that was fundamental to the world's thinking for a long time if you think quarter of the world's population under the control of uh, the british at the time if you think the americas the most recent introduction of blacks on mass to america was through the transatlantic slave trade north america south america central america so they came across a status of slaves so instantly you told them that they're lower they were considered as animals considered as property so they came with that idea and then of course colonialism in the african and asian continents and of course wider in you know oceania australasia and so forth where you're going and kicking people off their land and declaring yourself officially to be superior and others inferior so that ideology has now been exported internationally around the entire world so it's inevitable that our thinking or the way that we have our system set up or just the general way that we think is not going to be thinking about how we elevate others and how we view others and an elevated status and their culture and in this case their musical expression is considered to be of a higher class a higher quality more lofty more holy more appropriate for god more appropriate for our worship more appropriate for our listening uh, beneficial to our health scientifically proven whereas the music of that culture over there is savage wild unintellectual because it doesn't even hit the parts of the brain which deal with processing information or which deal with the will but it just bypasses them which mean that you, you end up being a total wild animal if you listen to this because you've lost the control of your will and then because it's not being processed by the parts of the brain which deal with intellect then of course it's the music of people who don't have intelligence yep that's the teaching that we find in prominence because if i can just pause and just say actually i believe that the adventist statement on its philosophy 
regarding music. I actually believe it's a really good statement. The the latest one, they used to have one in the church manual which said music of a jazz and rock nature in any, any its hybrid form, um, you know, should be shunned, etc., etc. I just felt it was just so badly written, it's incredible. But this new way of doing it, and, and this happened after pressure because I was actually on a committee where the proposed wording for the philosophy was being examined and you know I made my thoughts clear on that one <laughs> you know that uh, there needs to be a fundamental revisiting of the wording and what it's saying so I, I made that very clear personally and others did as well and I think what we have now the statement we have now actually I think is a really really good statement it's a really good statement it doesn't endeavor to try to to name or label put in labels or make any judgments on any musical genre as such but it talks about what I believe are some sound principles so I think it's a good a good statement so I must say that but nevertheless, you know, many of the presentations that we do find online, and trust me, I will say this again, if I haven't said it already, that I do have, you know, fundamental, you know, and genuine and heartfelt love for those who present, and welcome to join me for any Sabbath lunch, any time they're in the area, etc., etc., and I do believe that their hearts are sincere, that they do want to serve God, they do want to follow God, nevertheless, I believe that the information they have, which is their understanding, and I don't ever judge somebody for the understanding that they have, but the understanding they have, which has obviously been picked up by others, what others have said, so that's their understanding, and they believe it's it's right, the right way to um, address this whole issue of music. That's their understanding. But I do believe that it's important that those who do have you know, professional music education and training and musicology and music theory don't allow things just to be said and to go unchallenged without correcting even if it's just the correcting of fundamental errors which are wrong from a music theory point of view or a music history point of view just correcting things because what's happening is that across the world people are only getting this teaching this one-sided teaching so that's the only way that people think. So people think that is the right way. So when you now try to have a decent conversation with people and even try to use a Bible, the Bible is meaningless. Seriously. I've had conversations with people that the Bible is, doesn't mean a thing. But what the seminar said, that's the right thing. Even if the seminar is not backed up by what's said in Scripture, the seminar said it so therefore this is the way that we think this is its meaning so we now have a situation where people are now trusting what's said in the seminar rather than actually searching the word of god for themselves and on that note little plug i've set up a facebook page or group called what the bible says about music and also a corresponding youtube channel just going throughout the bible in a very simple way, not too deeply theological, but just looking at what the Bible does say about music, and literally it does what it says. We're going throughout the Bible, and where there is a text which talks about music, saying this is what it says, and then having a look at what it says, so that there is then an understanding of what the Bible actually does say about music, rather than what is my opinion about music, and let me just use this catch-all text which says, be ye not conformed to the world, Meaning, don't listen to worldly music, and worldly means music of the blues, music of the rock, music of R&B. That's what worldly means. We see that misuse of that text so many times, but again, it's just the way that we're thinking, so it's just normal. Nobody's challenging it. Today I'm challenging, I'm calling time on this now. You've had your time party's over we're now going to go back to the word of god and we're now going to start correcting some of these errors and i'm asking musicians please to join this is just the beginning of things but i want musicians to join do what i'm doing do a better version of what i'm doing be a part of the discussion let's now make a very very 
fundamental shift in the way that we do music and talk about music and musical attitudes. And let's not resign ourselves. Well, hey, man, the people there who are in charge ain't ever going to get it. No, 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 no. We will make sure that they do get it. We're not going to rest until they do. No human being is being endowed with such power from on high. No human being is being endowed with such power from on high that they are incapable of being addressed, incapable of being pointed out, called out when they are not acting in line with the word of God and God's principles. No human being should be allowed to get away with that. We've said very, very vocally and forcefully, enough is enough. We're not going to keep allowing these things to happen and keep allowing ourselves to be just beaten up, beaten up, denigrated, degraded, talked down, downtrodden, time and time again. And we just sit and just keep silence and say, well, it's never going to change. It's got to change. It's got to change. And we've got to be very, very determined to make sure that this change takes place. And the reason why I say it, and I might now be sounding a little bit militaristic and you might be saying, Ken, hold on, hold on. No, let me tell you straight. If we as a church are not at the forefront of such things as social justice and equality, there is no way we have any right to be talking to anybody about such things like well, when Sunday law comes, you know, all of a sudden you're supposed to just remember God's way and don't follow and don't be conformed to the world. When the world says go this direction and God says go that direction, then you've got to go that direction and follow God, not what the world says, and don't follow this great deception. But when it comes to racism and racial um, hierarchies, a way that we actually look at people, attributing them different levels of worth then literally you know well you just follow the world's way well you know, the world says segregation is the way to go through legislation or apartheid through legislation well we as a church really couldn't resist that because that, that was a law at the time you know but when god's law is being yeah you get where i'm coming with this okay you've got no right to be telling anybody about anything if you are fundamentally not following what God's word says with regards to how you apply the law and how you apply justice. No way should anybody be treating any teaching seriously if we're picking and choosing the ways in which we apply the word of God. Let's make that absolutely clear from the outset. Now I've got that off my chest, feels good. Well, before I start to talk about the specific attitudes and specific teachings and specific experiences, then I think it's fitting in order to create some sense of connection and rapport that I say a little bit about who I am. I'm not going to talk a lot about myself because it ain't about me. It's all about him, of course. But I am a musician by profession, profession in both senses of the word, one training to trade so i do music um, for a living so i pay by god's grace the taxes and the tithes and the donations to adra um is through what the lord allows me to do through music not all of it is what you would label religious music but again what does religion mean it's a different conversation for a different day how what one calls religion and what calls what one calls secular and sacred but i'm not going to go into that right now but regarding what we label fundamentally as sacred music, whatever. Not everything I do is in a sacred music genre. So I say that from now, just in case somebody says, who does he think he's talking about? And he's, you know, like, Don't worry about that. I do music professionally. Um, I make judgments on things which I know I shouldn't be a part of. Do I always get those judgments right? One might say no, one might say not sure, one might say yes. Nevertheless, you know, that's what I do for a living. But, the majority of what I do is in the field of sacred music, arranging or writing sacred music, orchestrating sacred music, conducting sacred music, 
Um, one of the things I do is work for a program in the United Kingdom. It's, I believe, the longest-running religious music program in the world. It's on the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, called Songs of Praise. And that's arranging and directing songs which come from uh, the different parts of Christian music, be it gospel, be it hymns, which is the majority of the repertoire, and worship songs. So I have a general overview of the background and the different approaches to Christian music. So Christian music is pretty much, you know, a large part of my life. So I'm able to talk a lot more in depth about you know Christian music and its history and its construction and the stories behind it. Am I because I'm a qualified musician and know it all? Definitely not. I would never want to be because I love learning. I love learning new things. I get excited about discovering new things. So nope, I don't know every single thing. I'm not writing everything musical, etc. There's still a lot to learn. On the other hand, as a professional, and I'm calling on my professional musician friends who've got professional qualifications, not, I went to a piano lesson last week, Tuesday. There I am, I'm qualified. But know those who actually have the the masters and the doctorates and the and you know the bachelors in music where you you know where your study has actually been marked and ticked and crossed etc etc where somebody's assessed it and said yep you know what you're talking about officially then we're the ones who really need to be talking about music and not leaving it to people who might have an interest in music or might have done music but are not actually musicologists to be able to really properly know the engine room and to properly be able to compare and contrast and to talk about what's going on, you know, underneath the hood or underneath the bonnet, as we say here in the UK, and how the machinery is working and how the cogs are turning. That's what we need to do. We have a responsibility, I believe, to do that because, not just to educate people, but because, as I said, the teaching which we do have has been based on injustice. I'm going to say it straight. That's what it's been based on that. So we have a duty to correct that and bring it to a place where God and God alone is being glorified. And by God being glorified, guess what it means? Our fellow human being is also being lifted to the place of worth and value. The second part of what I talk about today is going to be where I speak from a personal point of view of what Adventism means to me, how it speaks to social justice. So I'll be taking various bits of our Adventist message and saying this is why we actually ought to be at the forefront of leading the charge of talking about fundamental social justice and why the gospel actually is built on this idea of how we treat our fellow man. So I'll be talking about that. That's the second part. So if you get bored or you've got other stuff to do, then you can come back to that a little later. But it's it's an important part, which is tying things in together. It's the conclusion of this. But that's going to be the second part. This first part is going to be all about what I see as the fundamental problem, the fundamental issues. And I'll try and be as interesting as possible. So um, I will share many stories and I'll try to use my wit and my humour and my sarcasm to keep you interested. So where are the problems? Let's start with some of the childhood experiences that I had regarding music. So I would go to camp meetings and every year in the youth department we'd have presentations on is it right for adventists to dot 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 and then it's always going to be to listen to secular music or what music should we listen to or what is right and what is good music and we would have presentations given on comparing the music of the likes of michael jackson with a tribe in some african country now of course because the ignorance is that, well, Africa equals heathen, equals devil, equals voodoo, etc., etc. Then the feeling was that because there is comparison and there are similarities in this rhythm and look at the percussion instruments they're using, listen to this music, 
can you hear the percussion instruments are the same so therefore when you listen to a bit of Michael Jackson it's the same kind of demons and spirits which are going to inhabit your life so you're going to go to bed and the lights will switch themselves on and off and you go into the bathroom and the tap or the faucet as they say in America will switch itself on and off etc etc because you're inviting these spirits into your house because they are fundamentally inbuilt into the music and into these rhythms and each time you use a rhythm then you are instantly just off the devil instantly that's it there's no detachment it's fundamental that the devil is in that rhythm he inhabits in it he lives in it it's got a two bedroom apartment in that rhythm so that's been taught we have seminars in our churches where people are teaching this out of the same thing which is essentially saying that music which is right for you to listen to which is right for the church is essentially going to be of a European origin a European Mr. classical origin there's nothing wrong with that at all it's all lofty it's all holy and how dare you even attempt if you dare to talk about it or against it or if you don't like it there is something absolutely wrong with you I remember going to an Adventist concert where somebody actually made a statement that he who does not like classical music is somehow depraved and an intellectual and we're supposed to like it it's a a fundamental requirement your name is in the book of life if you can declare a love for classical music at the moment you speak against Bach the angel has taken his pen and right across your name ripped the page out the book of life thrown it away into a lake of fire hey I might be treating this thing like it's light but examine what I've said and tell me anything that is erroneous in terms of what people are actually teaching this is what is being taught if you're telling people that their musical choices their musical preferences are of the devil then you are essentially assigning them to hell by the choice of the music they like or they choose to use in the church setting take the music in the church angels walk out the angels have just left this place because of course the angels are under our jurisdiction they stick around at our say so and according to our personal tastes so that was a lot of the teaching growing up second thing I want to address is uh, experience that I personally had or my choir had and one of the groups I've listened to and I've followed growing up very instrumental in consolidating my my walk with Christ in my teenage years it's a group of heritage singers who I have a lot of respect and time for because they are an independent ministry they have longevity they've got loads of recordings they've got their own recording studio state-of-the-art they have produced material of consistent quality and you know they've really done a lot as a musical group on their own independently and have been heavily influential around the world and have been a to me a great success story I read their story beyond our dreams and I identified with one of the stories that they shared in their early days as a group they used to have well they still do have you know black singers singing in the group of course but in the early days of the group when they had black singers in the group when they used to go around to different churches and they weren't staying in hotels at the time because they were starting out so they would stay in the homes of church members they share that in those days there would be people who would come along to the concerts and enjoy 
plan to get room in the family and the happiness is to know their savior. They would be singing and enjoying plenty good room in the family. Plenty good room. But if it comes to having that black singer in our house, no longer plenty good room. We're full. Happiness is to know the Savior. Yep, yep. But I don't want to know you. So people would come and listen to the concerts and be blessed by it and elevated and ready for translation for heaven. But they were not, not housed the very minister, the musical minister, on the basis of skin color. And it's shared in the book. Uh, the singers would be in tears, in tears as they saw that happen. In a church preparing to meet its God. I said that earlier. It is possible. It's totally possible to have the attitude where you're actually in church every week serving God but still have the feeling that your fellow man is inferior to you. So what I'm saying is not unfair. If you thought at the beginning oh, that's a little bit you know, it's a little, little bit exaggerating or that's a bit unrealistic. No, not really an Adventist church that found in racism. Yes, it's possible for that to happen because it did. My own experience, exactly the same. Went, this was in Africa. This was not even in, you know, the United States or, 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 United, or Europe. This was in the African continent where we went. My choir went on tour to Zimbabwe. We did homestays and we had the church members who would be happy to come and say amen at the concerts. But looking the group, skin turns up and down and saying, I hope that one ain't coming to my house. I don't want that one in my house. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. So, that's possible. And these were not white Adventists, by the way. These were black Adventists. What did I say earlier? Racism is the, the mindset. It's a mindset. It's the ideology which exists in the mind. You don't have to be white. You don't have to be anything. It's just a mindset which exists in the mind of human beings, of people. It's so inbuilt, so ingrained. It was ingrained there. When we went to the African continent, it was ingrained in the minds of the natives of the country. Third experience I want to share is General Conference 2015. Now, there is no what we'd call overt and evident racism in somebody saying, you know, don't come on the stage or you're not welcome here. But what I saw there, I did address, I wrote to the General Conference when I got back and said, look, I noticed this and I'm not going to be here just to criticize. I actually want to say from the outset, I would like to be part of a solution and I'm offering myself to be a part of a solution to so GC 2020. We can not have a repeat of this. What it was is that if you've been to GC before, on a Saturday evening, after everything's finished, there is an event called the Parade of Nations. It's where all the countries where Adventism has a presence have a representative who bears a flag, comes on stage, and then you have presenters who say the population of this country is this and the Adventist population, the membership in that country, is this. I recall sitting there because I was part of uh, a mass choir which sang a song, an arrangement of Lift Up the Trumpet and We Have This Hope, but a great arrangement by Williams Costa with an orchestra and a, a massive choir. Very emotional actually singing that. Sometimes I couldn't even sing it because it was, you know, it was really emotional. I, I, I just felt a real um, sense of spiritual joy at that at that moment so we sat there having sang that song during this flag ceremony and i remember sitting there with my colleagues bass colleagues from the choir i was there with at the time 
and hearing the statistics of countries where we would think that there would not be much of an Adventist presence and then the presenters would come and say there are 450,000 or 600,000 Adventists and we're like, what? This country? So many Adventists? And then we'd sit there just feeling a sense of, wow, this work is really moving forward across the world. It's an amazing event that in so many parts of the world there is a strong Adventist presence. I was sitting near the South Americans. A rowdy lot they are. I guess it's all the sport and the football and so forth. But each time somebody came out from South America, then guess what? You know, the place erupted. It was just great. It was a place to be. That was a corner to be, the South American corner. It was amazing. Of course, when Jamaica was announced, that, that finished it off because that the place just the place just erupted. So it's an amazing just to see how international and how diverse this church is. And I believe recently it's been declared the most diverse faith book, faith, faith, faith book, too much social media, the most diverse faith group in the United States of America. You know what was, else was really amazing? It was on a Sabbath morning, right? There we are in San Antonio, gridlock on the streets, a city coming to a standstill, traffic all over the place and police directing traffic and so forth. The place is completely gridlocked. Why? Because people are on their way to Sabbath service. Can you imagine that? I think there were up to 100,000 people who came on that second Sabbath. And the, the city brought to a standstill by people going to church. I said, yes. <laughs> so praise God. Look at this. It was it was surreal. It was absolutely surreal to see the the entire city just well certainly that part of the city, I can't say it was the entire entire city, but certainly that part of the city where due to people coming to church, the streets are in chaos. Love it. So we have all of that. This wonderful diverse church. The South Americans cheering and the Africans and all the other continents cheering for their countries as we have this wonderful, wonderful display of God's moving by his Holy Spirit around the world. And then our worship service musically. Did it reflect the fact that the highest number of Seventh-day Adventists are in Brazil? Or there's a massive Adventist presence in the Philippines and Mexico? Massive Adventist presence in Kenya, Zimbabwe. Zambia, and we can keep going. Sorry if I didn't mention your country. Don't get offended. It's just I don't have time to mention every one of them. So much diversity. And what do we hear on stage? Do we hear anything with an African sound? Nope. The dominant musical sound is the music of the smallest division, where in some countries Adventism is dying <laughs> yeah but that's the biggest representation on stage what does that say with regards to privilege are we seriously suggesting seriously suggesting that there's not enough expression I know in Brazil you know artists like Leonardo Gonçalves topping the iTunes charts Adventist musician musician of Excellence, of excellence, tremendous musician, tremendous spirit filled musician. Okay, why weren't we hearing that representation on stage? We really didn't hear it, or didn't hear enough of it. Didn't hear enough of it. It was just biased towards one type of musical sound. 
that says privilege. The most I guess they got was you know, somebody said hello in Zulu. A little nod to the African continent. But it wasn't representation. And I said this to the conference. I wrote to the conference and I said there needs to be greater representation musically. Not only that, I also said there needs to be greater representation from an age group. Hey, come on. What are we saying about our church when we don't have any young people on that stage? What are we saying about the sort of church that we want to project, the image we want to project and who we are? When, again... I, I, Maybe I didn't see it, so I'm going to reserve a little bit of, you know, space just in case I'm getting this wrong, just to cover myself. But I am quite certain that over the two Sabbaths, there weren't young people on that stage. It wasn't a service which said, this is who we are, this is the kind of church we want to project ourselves to be. And yeah, okay, there may have been youth services, and but this was the... You know, the, 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 the global kind of worship service. It wasn't called the adult worship service. It was the worship service. So it should have been representative. But it's not. And then we've got to go through this process of putting music into GC where we've been told this year, I'm just remembering, uh, when we when we applied, well, well last year, of course, uh, was the application process. And of course, it's been postponed due to COVID. But we're told at the bottom... Be careful of music. This is what it said. Be mindful of music which is too rhythmic or too percussive in nature, or which has drums. At the bottom of that, I was thinking, come on. And I called that out. I said to my division president at the time, I said, you know, I just found that completely and utterly archaic and totally inappropriate. We need to grow up as a church. We need to grow up. Okay, this is, as I said, and I will keep saying, it's fundamentally based in an ideology. That's where it comes from. This fear of anything to do with drums, it's based in an ideology. Oh yeah, but Ellen White, didn't she have a vision? Yes, yeah, she had a vision of false worship and manipulative worship, which can happen in any way, shape or form. Some people think that musicians singing and playing soft music during an altar call. Some people consider that to be coercive and manipulative. No drums there. So that's where I felt we were failing. And I do believe that's because we've got this mindset. Where does this mindset come from? How can we have a church which is so diverse... But this mindset is allowed to prevail. I went to General Conference in 2000 in Toronto, and I don't know, this could have been intentional. Um, so I don't know if this was the case that they were asked, that different divisions were asked to be a lot more themselves in terms of how they represented themselves. But what I saw in that session, and I've said this many times to many people, that I saw, for example, when the East African Division were about to give their report, the leadership of that division came out, and they actually did a little high life dance. They used their, their music of the region, and then they were walking around in a circle. Do you know what happened in the church, or the audience at that stage, or congregation if you want to call them that, the delegation, they erupted with excitement to see people expressing themselves so openly and with joy is almost as if though they had a something inside of them just waiting to come out. That hope which we sing about in our theme song burns within our heart. It's as though they had this hope and this this joy waiting to come out so each time they had permission to express it they did and it wasn't just the east african division leaders having a wonderful time 
They gave the report afterwards, where they showed the magnificent way in which the Holy Spirit had moved in that region, over the Quinquennium, and how growth had been really steep. How the Lord had added numbers to the church over that five-year period. So there was a connection with that joy that they felt and the report that they gave afterwards. Do you know there are others who wrote about that experience and said, when the Africans came, we had to get up and leave. You know, the Spirit of God left the moment the Africans came. And even though they're about to talk about how the Spirit of God has moved in their region to win souls for his kingdom, but no, no, we couldn't stay in there. You know, we were, you know, the place was not holy enough for us, so we had to, we had to leave because uh, the Holy Spirit left, and you know, so we left with it. Oh no, we left first, and the Holy Spirit followed us out. Yet I'll say so. Ridiculous walking out because people dared to show some sense of joy. Okay, I'll leave that right there. And what I also want to mention, actually, the General Conference San Antonio 2015, Kimberly Palmer Washington came and sang Midnight Cry at the end of it all after we've done the Parade of Nations. And you know, when I saw the Parade of Nations, I saw the reaction. I thought, where was this in worship? I don't expect to see it throughout the week because it's fundamentally a business meeting. But I'm saying people do have something inside that they're waiting to, they're absolutely waiting to express but it's being continually suppressed people say suppress it keep it down keep it in check when Kimberly sang Midnight Cry it's like the church were I don't know I don't know what they were on they were on something because there was a sense of freedom and excitement and joy and reaction as she sang that, she, I mean, she didn't apologise for singing. She wasn't holding back. The church was fine with that. They had no issues. They brought into that. They got it. So why are we trying to quash the joy in our membership? Why? What do we hope to achieve? We're telling people they mustn't have a joy that burns within their hearts. It expresses itself so naturally. But we have to try to keep people so suppressed. And I would suggest it's because of the way we want to portray ourselves as a church. The sort of image we want. And there is this notion of respectability when you present yourself in certain ways and with certain musical sounds at the fore, it looks respectable because if you think about classical music, for example, it's formal music. The way it's done, it's formal. Oboe plays the A. Orchestra tunes to that. They're all dressed in bow ties and smart dress and the conductor comes out bows to the audience I'm speaking first hand I am a conductor I'm an orchestral conductor spent a lot of money on the tails <laughs> cost a lot of money but I know the protocol I've got loads of conducting batons which I can I can show you okay so you come out and you bow down and then you go and stand and you know shake the hand of the orchestral leader and it's all very formal and then you know everybody's very quiet and rather well-behaved, etc., etc. So it's got that sort of respectability about it. So if you are seen to be like that, then your church has this kind of look about it. But hey, no, you don't want to be a kind of church where somebody's kind of experienced. <laughs> yeah, they've had an experience, they've had an encounter, and they want to show it. But it doesn't look as respectable as you want it to look as controlled and as ordered so no 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 we disassociate ourselves from those folk from that type of expression yep we do that and it's a lot to do and i can tell you straight it's a lot to do 
with this idea of respectability. I'm from a Caribbean root. I always say I'm a jam cube because my father's born in Cuba, mother born in Jamaica. So yeah, I am a cube of jam. Hey, but that's what happens, you know, when Caribbeans come over from the Caribbean to the United Kingdom, they were part of the United Kingdom. They were British citizens. Their flag was the British flag. Their national anthem was God Save the Queen. They learned the British ways in school. So when they came over, there was a sense that they had to conform to be able to fit in. And one of the best ways to conform is certainly when you're in public, you, you would hear their voices change when they're speaking with people. They start to become like this and their eyes start to blink a little bit more, you know? to actually fit in with the culture, but when they're with their own, then they can be a little bit more more free and, and talk in the way that they know, know how to talk. So you learn these behaviours, particularly in church, how to turn off your kind of Caribbean roots and become a little bit more conformed to this way of doing things. So it definitely, definitely is something which says that to tie in with your at the African side of your roots is a no-go because that that brings you down. That makes you look a little bit less intellectual. But whereas if you tie into the, the, the British side of your, your 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 roots, then that can make you look more respectable. And people treat you more seriously and you look more intelligent. So that it's very, very real how it was. That's the way it was. So I'm not saying anything that is crazily out there, anything that is not even known, that is the truth. We want to put on this image of what sort of church we want to look like, and we want it to look in a particular way. So that's where a lot of these attitudes are also coming from. So now I'm going to go through a few of the attitudes that have been taught, well, that are being taught, that are being presented as being scientific or as being truth when it comes to talking about music. So I've spoken about some of the experiences. Now I'm going to speak about some of the specific teachings and I'm going to assess them again. This is just the beginning of a conversation, even though I might seem to be talking too much, but this is the, the, the beginning of a conversation and we need to examine this a lot more and I just want people to think about this and think about where these attitudes actually come from. So I've got it written down here. I like to speak from the heart but when I speak from the heart I end up talking too much so I need to keep it under control. So here we go. The general teaching is that the music which promotes good health is the music which is of European origin from a specific era, specifically the Baroque era. Now, the problem with that is not so much that fact that that music might promote health, then, you know, there is a set of characteristics in Baroque music, such as what's called the motto perpetuo, the actual continual movement, and the, the, the lightness of the instruments, because instruments weren't developed to be really heavy as they were, for example, in the music of Wagner. But the music is quite light in nature and a lot of the music at the time was being written you know either for the church or in sometimes for you know for the court for so for kind of high society so it was designed to be quite in its nature you know formal and quite sort of um noble in its in its nature in its construct so i have no issue at all with the idea that such a form of music presentation might stimulate, you know, um, relaxation or good health, etc., etc., because the frequencies at which instruments are playing and so forth. There's no issues in actually, you know, saying that there is good music in Baroque music and it can help. I'm not going to dispute that element. Okay. However, however, the issue I then have 
is when that is contrasted and how that's spoken about in relation to the music which is considered to be bad for you, bad for your health. The general teaching says that in Africa they have indigenous religions, among them the Vodon or Voodoo religion, and part of their religion involves ceremonies where they are getting into trances and endeavouring to be possessed by spirits, taken over by the gods or whatever, or higher powers. And because they found it difficult to let go of that, then all they did was they just married it with the Western music. Implication being that the Western music they had was all okay. Their music wasn't okay. And putting them together, they therefore contaminated this pure Western music. Again, what I say, if you were to put the searches in the search engine, you will find the very statements made which suggest that the music of Europe was referred to as the beautiful music. And what happened with the African influence was the beginning of introducing the idea of, of devil, the devil, into music. So that's how the teaching goes. Again, the problem I have with that is not the fact that, yes, there is such a thing called voodoo worship and where they call it the spirits. By the way, by the way, even though voodoo is not how I do life, it's not my world view, but there is a sense, even in the cultures which are doing these ceremonies, there is a sense within their cultures of right and wrong. They're not saying, okay, let's all gather together, play some drums so that we can all now be evil and do evil things. What they're doing in their ceremonies and some of the, the rhythms that they use and so forth are actually all about reflecting and making sense of and navigating life. Ethnomusicologists who've studied this thing properly will tell you that that's what the, the music is doing. It's, it's a reflection of life and there is, there is a purpose to it and what they're trying to do. And yes, while there are things about it which do not accord with our understanding of Scripture and how God wants to do things, but it's their local culture. And what I'm talking about is not the right or wrongness of it, but the way that we just call it and dismiss it as devilish. And the fact that we use the word devilish because we feel we can, not because of anything to do with the devil, but because of who the people we're talking about. We use that terminology just so easily and freely because that's how we think of the people. That's how the people were thought of at that time. That's what was taught. That was taught in pseudoscience. That they were just animalistic and wild and not human and not intelligent. So that's the teaching about the people. So when we use these terms so easily to talk about the music as being of the devil, 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 then we're not speaking from a theological level. We're really just borrowing the language of racism. That's what's happening at that point. And then they talk about the drum and syncopation and rhythm and beat. You've often heard the teaching that there are three elements of music, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And the greatest of these is melody. You've heard that, yeah? So we're told that rhythm is kind of at the bottom. Where does that come from? So, what you have, again, search for it, you will see it. This idea that the music which is good for the health, the music which is to be 
listened to, the music which is to be embraced, and the music which is to be respected is melodic music. Melodic music of the European Baroque era. So, melody lifted high, and it's connected with European music. What is rhythm connected with? Which continent? Which culture? It's connected with the African culture. It's at the bottom. Do you see the connection there? And the problem with that teaching, again, is that it's actually not even accurate, because melody defined is the combination of music on the vertical plane and the horizontal plane. So vertical to do with pitch, high and low. But it doesn't just exist in random high and low. There's got to be a way in which it's structured within time, the temporal organization of these pitches, which is called rhythm. So pitch plus rhythm equals melody. So this idea that rhythm is somewhere at the bottom and melody is at the top. Melody inherently has a rhythm. The argument that harmony is in second place, again, is just nonsense. If you know the history of harmony, Western harmony is a few hundred years old. It's not been around for thousands and thousands of years. Well, the concept of harmony, of being able to sing two notes at once or play two notes at once, yes, but I'm saying that harmony as we know it is actually quite new, historically. What about music which doesn't even have harmony because somebody's just singing a solo vocal piece? There is no harmony. What about music of certain cultures where, you know, it's not one, four and five harmonies, but music is completely different? See, these kind of teachings don't even consider the fact that there are other parts of the world to suggest that the right music is the music of the Baroque era. So what's people been doing all these years? That would suggest that the music that Jesus sang, the hymn that he sang, somehow was wrong. Because the right music is the music of the Baroque era. Okay, so even from a historical point of view, you can see that just... The whole thing doesn't make sense. It's designed to put a particular idea across, and that's a supremacist idea. So, I've just talked about this erroneous notion that music can be put into different hierarchies of melody, harmony, and rhythm, and that doesn't even make any sense anyway. Another thing, oh yeah, music used to be on the one and the three. It is now in this new demonic paradigm on the two and the four. Yeah, right. So what about music which is in three, which doesn't even have a fourth beat? So that's for that argument out the window. But further than that, how about the fact that music in this isometric you know, four four two four whatever again it's not how music has always been you listen to music which has maintained its roots from thousands of years ago even maybe then and i say maybe because a lot of people are not sure exactly what the music was like but i'm sure that a lot of the cultures in africa and asia and the intersection, which is commonly known as the Middle East, have preserved down the years a lot of their cultural music. And if you listen to it, you will see that it's not in two, four, three, four, 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 six, eight, like we have music in the Western world. It's very different. You know, if you look at Arabic music, for example, it's based very much on on speech. And we don't speak in four, four. We speak in a natural way, and the music does that as well. It's connected with speech, so there is no kind of 4 4. So, again, that's just a nonsense to try to again put the music of a particular culture on an elevated status. And then we have 
It's teaching about syncopation and rhythm. Again, you'll often see that people don't even know the difference between a beat, which is a pulse of time, a rhythm, a syncopation, and a drum. People talk about these syncopated drum beats or the syncopated drums. Where is a syncopated drum? No such thing. Does it even make grammatical sense? Syncopation is a type of rhythm which exists very naturally in life. We talk in syncopations. We live with syncopation around us. You go walking down the street and your feet are doing click-clock, 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 click-clock. All right, in regular timing. And in between those, you have different sounds happening. We live in syncopation. So that in itself is a complete and utter nonsense to suggest that syncopation your heart's going to go out of sync and your brain's going to fall out of your head and again that is based on a racist route because syncopation is connected with African music but hold on a minute syncopation isn't African there's nothing African about syncopation as I said it's a natural part of life and it's a prominent part of classical music. Classical composers loved to use syncopation. Beethoven, somebody who I'm an enthusiast, I've studied a lot of his music. He's 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 a syncopation in, enthusiast. He's Mr. Syncopation himself. And what was so funny in one of these presentations where they're trying to talk about the right, you know, music, the music that's good for you is music in 4-4. I remember somebody talking about music in 4-4 and they played a piece of music which was in 3-2 to demonstrate <laughs> the 4-4 beat. They said, yes, yeah, see, this music in 4-4 and playing a piece of music in 3-2. Professional musicians, that's why we are needed. In fact, you don't even need to be professional to know the difference between 4-4 and 3-2, but that's why we're needed to catch because this is what people are getting and, you know, most people don't understand what 3-2 and 4-4 is. But somebody's telling them that and teaching them that and they're just telling you this now. They're people trying to have conversations with me and trying to educate me about music. Of, you know, I'm saying, what is a syncopation? Well, it's a drum. Uh, it's not a drum beat, but it's this and that. You know, well, go and watch this video and go and watch a seminar, etc., etc. As it used to be. Or, well, why don't you go and join a Sunday church? I've been told I must go and join a Sunday church simply because I actually dared to use my brain a little bit and challenge them. So you just dismissed me. Uh, I can't be a proper Adventist because I'm actually thinking for myself and I'm not just saying the same old scripts which I've been taught to say. It, it's astounding. You know, the scriptures tell us, give a reason for the hope within you. Come, let us reason together. In other words, use your brain, use your mind. And just repeat everything that you just hear everybody saying and just like it's truth because it sounds right. It's astounding. So, it's another error. I, a couple of years ago, was asked to come out to Poland to do a music seminar. And I did an experiment. I played two pieces of music just using percussion. So extracts from two pieces of music. And I told them that one of them was a piece of music from a sub-Saharan African country. The other one was music of a classical German composer. So I programmed them just using drums, so they just heard it from a purely rhythmical point of view, and it was their task to indicate which one they thought was German one, which one they, indica which one they would indicate was the African one. So one had a very straight rhythm. All right, which they said, as to be expected, of course, was his German one. One had lots of syncopation and polyrhythms. That's where rhythms cross over. And uh, one of the presentations that you will see a lot, this is the distraction dilemma, speaks a lot about polyrhythms and how polyrhythms are are not good and what they do, etc., etc., how they're so dangerous for you and uh, how, of course, they're so inherent in African music. So therefore, they must be shunned at all costs because polyrhythms mean that 
your frontal cortex, your the front of your brain is being bypassed, and then you will now be led into a into a trance, even though the drummers who play this music where people are going into a trance don't go into a trance themselves, but hey, don't worry about that. <laughs> so where was I? I was talking about um this general teaching of polyrhythms and the dangers of polyrhythm. Again, we musicians need to be able to educate people about what a polyrhythm actually really is and how it's part of life and the differences between the polyrhythm and polymeter, which is not really clearly understood by those who are presenting. But anyway, that's why we are needed. But anyway, the example I gave in Poland was of music which was highly polyrhythmic, highly syncopated. Again, they guessed as we expect them to, they guess that was the music of Africa. Now, they weren't wrong in their assessment because a lot of German music has strict rhythm. A lot of African music has, you know, cross rhythm or polymeter. And a lot of hybrid African music of genres has a lot of syncopation, be it jazz, be it gospel. But I'm sure you know where I'm heading with this one. They weren't correct. The one with the straight rhythm was sub-Saharan African. The one with the syncopated polyrhythmic was actually a piece of classical music. And I had the classical score. I showed them what each instrument was doing and how that created the polyrhythm. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to do that. I've actually programmed it. So I'm going to present it as a, as a separate little presentation on a set of programs I'm doing called Musical Notes, where you can see how this... Uh, you know, a lot of classical music, which we consider as being all straight rhythm and, you know, all on a, on a one and a three and not a two and a four. And I'm just going to completely correct the information on that and just dispel all myths about that as I share examples of music where polyrhythm and syncopation is used by people across the world because it's an exciting way of doing rhythm. And it's used a lot in all genres of music and a lot in classical music. So that's another error. And then, of course, they associated that with drums, because, of course, drums are the rhythm instrument. Again, lack of understanding about drums. Little understanding about what the drums do and the purpose of drums and their role. And the fact that not everything that a drum plays is actually syncopated. A lot of times it's not a syncopated rhythm at all. So, or, or syncopated beat, as they like to call it. There's no such thing as a syncopated beat anyway. Uh, syncopation is a type of rhythm, not a beat. A beat is a pulse of music. A pulse in music, sorry. A pulse of time. All right, so they talk about the drums and the danger of percussion music. <laughs> Here's the one they... I love hearing this one. In the temple, they didn't use any percussion music. They only had a lyre, a harp, and a cymbal. But they were no percussion instruments. Because, of course... A cymbal, well, is percussion. Uh, well, yes, yes, well, it is percussion, but, you know, they didn't play clash, clash, clash. They just went ding to start. It was just, it was something to um, to begin to signal the, the new text when they were actually reading the Torah, when they were reading the law. They used to just use this as a marker, but there was no kind of, clashings of symbols and so forth so therefore because there were none then how dare we bring our drums into the church when there were no drums in in in, in the temple of course let's conveniently forget that there were no pianos in the temple no violins in the temple no flutes no wind instruments in the temple no oboes in the temple i can keep going on keep going on keep going on so that argument is dead before anybody starts. I don't know how anybody can seriously try to put across such an unintellectual argument of that nature. That's beyond me, to be honest with me. Okay, I mean, not to even mention the fact that Psalms talks about the procession into the temple, Psalm 68, and it says among them are the maidens with their drums. Or The, the Hebrew word for drum is tof, T-O-F, which means a frame drum. All right, so there's a different variety of drums. It's not just the tambourine, as we often translate it, but different types of 
frame drum were under this thing called a top, and it was part of the culture. They used it. There's no problem with it. I'm not quite sure why we believe there was and why we think that we have to somehow try to make scripture fit into our idea that drums are so wrong. They were used as part of Hebrew culture. Drums and dance. Get over it. <laughs> Seriously, get over it and grow up. All right, And I don't apologize for saying it like that because the Bible is very clear on these things. Yes, I know there may have been a misunderstanding of a particular word which was translated as dance and it really meant a pipe and a flute, but we know they dance in the culture. If it meant a pipe, we, the implication is still that it's a merry instrument with which they danced to. And in the book of Jeremiah, God talks about the restoration of Israel. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young maiden should go out, take the tambourines, and go out to dance with the joyful. All right? It wasn't a problem to God. It wasn't a problem for Jesus to include the idea of dance in the story of the prodigal son, or to quote that proverb, you know, we play the flute and you wouldn't dance to show the slight nonchalance and the indifference of the the nation at the time who just seemed really hard to please and not satisfied with anything. They just had no issues with that. Now, I, I completely understand that we've got to be very careful that we don't bring anything into the church that ought not be there. Totally understand that. But the way we do that is not to sort of say, well, the Bible somehow speaks against dance when it doesn't. And the Bible somehow speaks about against drums when it doesn't. Yeah, but it says, be not conformed to the world. Be you not conformed to the world. Yes, the Bible does say that. So what are you suggesting? The drums and dance are of the world, so therefore don't... And complete. What, what sort of theology and teaching is that? Come on. As I said, let's grow up and be a bit more sensible and have a grown-up conversation about this. It's things like that, you know, they do frustrate me, as you can probably hear in my voice. I'm supposed to be lovely and calm, but it's it's frustrating kind of teaching because what we're doing with that and, you know, anything in, 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 in Scripture where these sort of teachings are used in that way, they were called out and they said, shout aloud and spare it not. And, you know, Jesus was described as angry actually when he overturned the temples the tables in the temple and when he looked around in anger it says when he was about to heal somebody it's because people were just not giving people the fundamental respect of being a human being with any sense of value so he spoke out against it, and i'm speaking against that now because i said it's connected to an ideology it really is tied in with this whole ideology. We talk against the drums. What we're really talking about, it's not the drums, we're talking about African culture because, you know, the history of this suspicion with the drums certainly wasn't in Europe. As far as I know, I mean, do correct me if I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrong, but the, the, the European classical composers use drums. I mean, the Beethoven 9th Symphony, big drum, doing dum, 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 at the speed of of dance music in a club. Just the banging of the drum. You could, you know, I, I, I'll do an analysis another day of, of different elements in classical music where you would actually see that there is very little difference, even though we try to paint this idea of this does, this would never happen in classical music. That ain't true. Stuff does happen in classical music. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> Didn't have these kind of hang-ups as we have. All right? So, this idea of vilifying the drum is really vilifying the people who it's attached to because a lot of the history behind the vilification of the drum is that when Afri West Africans came across to the Americas, in the Caribbean they were allowed to keep their instruments, but the Americas... What happened, they took the drums away because they said that the drums were able to create an atmosphere which then led to rebellion. Of course, rebellion is not good for the economy. If you've got slaves running away, then how am I going to get rich? So take the drums away, then they can't do their little ceremonies and their private little secret messages using the drums. And then what I do is I just say, well, I'm taking them away because the drums are, they are in, in, inherently evil. They're evil. They cause them to do evil things. They cause them to rebel. 
They cause them to want to be free. And, you know, the Bible says Christ has given us freedom so that we can be free. And he has set us free. So how dare they wish to be free? How dare they wish to not be in chains? So we're taking away their instruments because the devil is influencing them to do things that, you know, God would never have them to be free. So therefore, we're taking the drums away. And that's where this idea of suspicion of the drums came and suspicion of rhythm and all that kind of stuff. Okay? And as I said, I'm not dismissing the fact that there is within the practice of some, you know, West African ind indigenous religions, you know, ceremonies where people do actually get into trances and they fall or they want to be possessed by the spirits, etc., etc. That does happen. That, But I'm saying that's part of their culture. I don't call it evil, okay? I don't call it evil as such. I call it maybe not, it's not necessarily what I subscribe in my worldview, but I'm not going to join in the voices which just automatically associate that with being the devil or devilish. I'm not going to join those voices. Because you ain't done that to the Western religions, which you also think are in error as well. They're not referred to as devilish, just respectfully deceived. So that's the problem that people have with drums. It's associated. Apparently the drum is supposed to have a brain and has the ability to uh, influence people to do things because it has a brain and it has intelligence and there's something cognitive within the drum itself would like you to do something please because you are watching this on social media so you have the ability to feedback so can you pause this for a while please type into a search engine drumming and the brain because the teaching is that you know certain types of music they bypass the whole area of the brain which deals with reason and intelligence and processing information and goes straight to the the base, the carnal nature of mankind. So, if you can just type that in to a search engine, drumming and the brain, and just put what you find, the first thing that you find, or the first things that you find in the search regarding the latest science relating to drumming and the brain. You see, the thing with science is that it does what we as Christians or Seventh Adventists don't want to do. It moves. It's willing to acknowledge that, okay, we didn't quite understand this correctly, but now we have a greater understanding, then we're going to move our position. So with now the development of such things as encelograms, things which measure activity in the brain, now they're looking at what happens when you do music and which part of the brain are processing music, such as frontal lobe, frontal you know, frontal cortex, hippocampus, corpus callosum, etc., those parts of the brain, then they're seeing where activities are actually happening in the brain and they're changing certain things, which we've often said were, you know, science has proven this. Remember that one about the mice? Well, empirical science has shown that when mice listened to rock music they killed themselves and when they listened to classical music they were able to find their way through a maze now i don't doubt that when they listened to the rock music in that experiment that they turned violent and when they listened to the classical music then they were a karma simply because they probably played calm classical music and they probably played aggressive rock music but what would have happened if they played calm rock music of which there is and they played more aggressive classical music, of which they is, do you think the mice are going to say, squeak, 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 we must kill ourselves now because this is rock music, even though it's gentle, but it's called rock. So in order to help this experiment, I think it was a young school kid who did it, but I'm not dismissing it because it's a young school kid. Young school kids can be brilliant minds. But, you know, this is called rock music, so we must now, and this is classical music, so we must now behave ourselves. Or did they just hear sounds and this is really the point I want to make to anybody who's putting across any teaching relating to genres. 
in fact that genres within the genres there is a breadth of musical styles and types so you'll find the gentle music which has a label of rock or pop and you'll find extremely loud and aggressive music which has a label of classical but you see music by labels why because with the label comes the association with a particular culture so classical is cultured is up there and rock is uncultured it's down there and it's music which has its roots in the african so it's automatically down there because that's how we see the african so we need to have this discussion this fundamental shift in the way that we think and i've committed myself and i'm going to sign off now but i'm committed myself to making sure that i i'm vocally calling these things out it's been a long time i've wanted to present this but time hasn't permitted but um because of things like lockdown i've been able to do things that were on the to-do list for years but i'm putting it out there because i really don't want to keep hearing this over and over again and the sad thing is hearing it from people who i'm not saying that it's a you know it's a color thing i was about to say something which maybe was a wrong thing to say that you know you know I, i'm hearing it from coming from black people so i want to say here it come from black people uh for me makes it slightly you know you kind of feel almost betrayed when you when you hear it in that way because you're thinking well that's teaching that people have used against you and you're now using it against just you're buying into that and using it against your own self here is an example where somebody quoted ellen white ellen white spoke about the music of the opera you got to remember that time music was received very differently there was no internet no spotify at the time for you to know music of different cultures and know a bit of background so you were hearing it experiencing it for the first time so the opera came and well, you know was it's it'd been around for a couple of hundred years of course but you know there was a lot of music um, which was at its height in operatic music at its height around that time when and white was around and she speaks about the opera. She said the opera with its drawn out notes and its strange, its peculiar sounds. As some presenter presented about this again. Dear brother, welcome to my house for Sabbath lunch. Okay, I'll greet you with a hug. Well, after coronavirus, I'll, I'll, treat, I'll, I'll greet you with a hug and what kind of stuff. As a brother, no problem at all. I'm not getting at any person. I'm getting at a point. I'm getting at an, an idea of things that have been fed into our minds which we then teach but then this presentation it's online you can see it gives a demonstration and it's talking about music and then various demonstrations are given about the music which they believe exemplifies what they're talking about so this particular quote from Ellen White which talks about the strange sounds of the opera and long drawn out notes then an example is about to be given so I'm expecting to hear something from Leno La Traviata yeah, it's not something from Puccini or uh, Notte de Figaro or some, some little hell no type note. What does the brother play? He gives an example from somebody holding out a note singing gospel. So even when somebody expressly mentions classical, because you're so committed to this idea that everything of the African root is bad, you even have to give an example about classical music by using an African, uh, well, a gospel, but an African root genre. What does that say? Well, I've spoken a lot about this first part, and there's more of a conversation to be had, and this was really just to tease our thinking. There will be a second part where I do go and talk about how I believe Adventism, how our doctrines do speak much more relevantly than we give it credit for to themes of such things as social justice. But before I go into that section, I just do want to share 
a story, share a, a real life anecdote. And some years ago in the mid 90s, I did an album with my church choir, my Adventist church choir. And I'm not afraid to use different musical genres. We've had African music on there side by side with classical music in Latin, which some didn't like because they thought it felt too Catholic to them, although it's Sanctus, which is based on Isaiah 6, verse 4. But anyway, there's a piece on there called Running Away. When I envisaged the piece, when it was, I was inspired to write it, it was based on a heartbeat, you know, a sense of urgency of somebody who's actually running. So, you know, that kind of feel, although that's not the particular rhythm. The rhythm is... And it really is supposed to be, you know, a sense of urgency. That that was needed. That particular beat was needed because it was a heartbeat. I almost forgot to mention a point about beat and rhythm and percussion, which we've been told is so dangerous for us. Remember the nine months, if you did the full term, in the womb. What was the continual sound that you would have been exposed to? In addition to the you know, swishing of, of fluids, but you would have been composed, um, composed, come on, got music in my brain. You would have been exposed continually to, maybe composed, it's continual exposed to composed. No, you'd have been continually exposed to a heartbeat. You were exposed to that exclusively, All right? So Beat was the first thing that you were exposed to in life. And it's a thing that we gravitate to. And we're told we're wrong to gravitate to it. There's something inherently sinful about gravitating to beat. Or people put these beats in so people can actually, you know, they pick up the beat first and that's wrong. Is it? Okay. Well, maybe it is. Maybe we need to send a memo to heaven to tell God that, you know, the beats that uh, we're exposed to before birth are somehow wrong. It needs to change it and get the kidneys to play some beautiful string music, you know, play a bit of Bach while we're in the womb so that will that will help us to calm us down and to make sure that we're all nice and healthy when we're born. Anyway, I was sharing a story about this heartbeat type rhythm in this piece of music and my father who my late father who was you know a church worker a bible worker and who would invite people to our concerts invited somebody to come who had decided that uh, she wanted to take a temporary break from the church for whatever reason we invited her to come to the choir's concert the first half of the concert we actually did traditional spirituals and classical music and she sat there Looking at the watch, saying, okay, when is this all finished? Don't you know I've got a, a nightclub or a party to get to after this? So she stayed there. She was, I guess she was about to leave in the second half, but in a way, she was compelled to remain in the second half. She said she just heard the songs, clapped and said, okay, great, next, 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 next. Then we got to this piece of music, which... I got a lot of flack for because of its very prominent beat and people would frown and turn their faces to the side every time we would play it in a church setting, whatever. You know, what are we bringing into the church? Ushering in the final deception. Sunday Lord's going to be passed next week after this song. But anyway, <laughs> she hears this rhythm. We sing this piece which is a real honest piece of music, which begins with the words, you know. It begins, you know. You know that you need a better way of living, but you just keep running away from reality. In other words, it's telling somebody, you, you know what you're doing. You know the truth. You know where you should be. And I'm telling you straight, you know it. Stop messing around. Stop playing around. Stop fooling around. 
Okay, don't kid yourself. But all of that is to this thumping beat. Now, according to those who perpetuate this idea that such music means that your reason and your will is bypassed, so therefore you are then unable to make any meaningful decision about following Jesus Christ, then I'm going to have to apologize. I, I'm ever so sorry. I'm really, I, I apologize. I really, honestly, I hope you find it in your heart to forgive me when I tell you that that particular song was the song of the evening after all this correct music that we had before. It's wonderful classical music we had before. That was a song which arrested the attention of that young lady to say, I am running away. I am fooling around for my life. I need to run back to Jesus, run back to the faith. And that song moved her. Joined the choir for a while and sang with the choir for a few years. Okay. So, please, let's get rid of this idea of my God is not a hip-hop God. You've heard many people coming up with that. God is not a hip-hop God. God could never lower himself that one could express anything to do with God or say anything about God using the hip-hop genre because God is not a hip-hop God. Maybe he's not. So what is he? Is he a Bach God? Is he a Mozart God? What is he? I mean, let's consider people said Nazareth. Can anything, or by implication, can anyone good come out of Nazareth? As in the Son of God? <laughs> so, perhaps, just like Jesus came out of Nazareth and became nothing, and became poor, that we might in him become rich, that he took on death, even death upon a cross, that out of his name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Maybe God does step into the language of the people who understand that from the cultures and the neighborhoods where they live and where they communicate in that. Perhaps God does communicate to people, as indeed he has done, of those who, through listening to hip-hop gospel, have had their lives turned around to follow God. I really don't see a lot of people routinely coming out of classical concerts having made a decision for baptism. I, I, I could be wrong. And nothing wrong with the music. I am a classical musician by training or any letter after my name has been achieved by the power of God. But as a result of my studying of classical music. But I just don't routinely go to classical concerts, religious classical concerts, and seeing people saying, oh, I give my life to God. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But what I am saying is that the atmosphere and the scene where that happens is much more often in this atmosphere playing the wrong kind of music, the devil's kind of music, than this so-called lofty, elevated music which we're not ever supposed to say anything against. So I will leave it there for the time being, for part one of this, before I go into part two, and invite you to make comments, invite you to be a part of the conversation. I have colleagues out there, many who I believe, I'm not putting myself down, but many who I believe have even more articulate ways of dealing with this subject and who can crystallize this information in different and even deeper ways than I've done so here. And 
please, we need to hear your voice and we need to have a collective voice which we can use as a resource so that people can actually refer to this and have a much more informed education about music and understanding where attitudes come from. This needs to go to leadership to actually say, look, we don't believe that the general teachings which have been allowed to perpetuate around the world regarding how we talk about music and even particular worship styles has actually come from a desire to be more you know, spiritual or to be more representative of God's way because trust me if we're looking at the biblical way of doing things then it's very 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 different from what we're teaching very different a completely different culture all right completely different ways of expressions completely different actions and different words that they use in their culture to express praise like ruah and ranan and shabakh which means to shout your head off we need to let this message be heard for the sake of making sure that we get the justice and equality that god requires and also I think it will be very beneficial in helping even our evangelism when we can paint an image to people of people who have an understanding. That doesn't mean to say like, everything goes. That, that doesn't mean that. That's, but I'm not talking about standards. I'm not talking here about sin. I'm talking here about equality justice and where our mindsets come from and how that particular mindset comes from a root which I will say is a sinful root if I'm going to talk about sin it's the sin of inequality it's the sin of racial hierarchy which is perpetuated designed to keep others down down always at the bottom Proverbially, the knee on the neck. So through conversation, we can start to change mindsets, start to change attitudes, start to make people feel more at home in the different expressions. Maybe we can start winning some souls because a lot of the churches who are a lot more connected biblically with musical expressions people are drawn to that people are drawn to that and yeah I know what you're going to say people shouldn't be drawn to the music they should be drawn to God but come on human beings are drawn to things they are similar We're, any human being is drawn to something and you can be drawn yes to a music but through that music you get to experience God it's a vehicle through which you experience God so let's not try to be overly clever by saying, you know, if somebody joins a church because the music is lively, they're only joining because of, of, the, of the music and their aims are not noble or pure. But if it's classical music, then we'll consider that they've joined because of God. Those are the arguments that I am now challenging and telling us to repent and you know, rethink we think where all that's coming from. All right. And I've seen it as a professional musician firsthand and know its root because I know classical music enough to know that the story is being twisted to favour and to present in a good light various musical genres and expressions. It's my responsibility to talk. All right, so God bless us in our endeavour as we work towards his kingdom together. And I will explain more in part two about how I think our doctrine ties in with that whole notion of justice, equality before one father. Please stick around or join me again another day to hear part two. 
but it's coming up in a moment. So let's talk about Adventism for a while. So I am 50 years old by God's grace at the time of filming this and I give God thanks for every one of those years. I've been a Seventh-day Adventist all that time. Never once have I entertained the idea that I'm going to see what's on the other side. I'm just going to take a little break from the Lord for a while just to try and prove that the world is not for me. I've not done that. I've been in the church, I've been active in the church. I've loved it here. I feel at home here. I'll be here for the rest of my life. And there's nowhere else I'm going. Okay. So I'm solidly within the Adventist church. So sorry if you wanted to try and win me over to your church. Ain't coming. Sorry. I'm happy where I am. I'm sticking here. I love Adventism and I love what it stands for. I love its message. I don't think that we understand our message I don't think we understand how great our message is, and I don't think we know how to apply the message in a practical way. And that's why we end up getting caught up in the way that the world thinks, and we don't actually counteract that. We don't provide a strong enough voice against things that are not of God. I'm just going to give you a few examples, but to put a few things in your head then you can go and think about the rest of the conversation, you know. But I'm going to name a few things about Adventism that I believe speak to this theme of social justice and why within everything that we talk about relating to music or other areas, we should be speaking in a completely different paradigm. You see, how we're trying to speak, we're trying to speak in how can we make ourselves look correct? How can we make ourselves look righteous? And if we have the right kind of music and the right kind of look, the right kind of image, hey, then we can look good. We can look respectable. We want to keep away from the influence of other churches. Guess what we mean when we say we don't want other churches' music in our church? Guess whose music we're talking about? Are we talking about Methodist music? Are we talking about Baptist music? Are we talking about music which has a sort of Catholic atmosphere about it in terms of being gentle and chant-like? I'm just being slightly almost sort of stereotypical because I recognize that within these churches there is a variety as well but I'm saying when we're talking about which churches music we do not want to come to ours we are talking about black churches we're talking about the Pentecostal music we don't want in our church we ain't talking about any of the other churches which have a European root we're fine we've, our, our, our hymn books are full of that full of the music we're talking about African music we don't want a church to black. That's not something that anybody from any particular culture, that is right across the board. You can go to any, you can go to the African culture, they all say the same. <laughs> go to Asia, they'll say similar things. In part, not all, because I've been to, the, we've, we've got an Asian church, a couple of Asian Adventist churches here. I've been to them and guess what? They took the instruments out, they sang their Asian music, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is almost surreal. I am in an Adventist setting, and this sounds, this is authentic Asian music. It wasn't them trying to sing an Asian version of Lift Up the Trumpet. They were singing Asian music in an Asian way, using Asian sounds. All right, I know Asian is, Asia is a continent, not a country, but the actual church was called, you know, Adventist Asian church and there were people from different Asian cultures there um, Indian cultures were leading out in that one and they were playing the music which was Indian in nature without you know unapologetically Indian and I just thought this is brilliant this is what church should be like different sounds like everybody trying to be one thing yeah we should have unity but we don't have to have unison we don't have to all be doing the same thing but 
different parts, but with the same aim, the same goal, serving the same God, preaching the same message. So yeah, we have this rich diversity within Adventism. And this is something I love about our church, is that we are represented right across the world. We were recently labeled as the most diverse faith group in America, not just Christian group, but faith group in America. That is fantastic. That is what we're supposed to be, you know, diverse, because our philosophy says we are to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So that should be reflected definitely in our churches. So for me, Adventism says that I believe in God because my name has seventh day in it, which means I believe that there is a holy day called the Sabbath, which is the memorial of God's what? Creation. So God's creation means that God is what? Creator. God created man in his image, breathed into clay, dust, and man became what? A living soul. And that initial breath that God put, God said, be fruitful, multiply. So every single one of us as human beings, when we're breathing, are just breathing the breath of who? The breath which God put originally in Adam, from which the human race is derived. So if we are carrying within us breath, which has been given by God. And please don't get frightened to so stop thinking I'm going to start talking about something new agey, you know, God within us and I am my own God, etc. No, no, we know all of that. Okay, I'm talking from our understanding as Adventists. Let's stick to that. Because somebody has within them the breath which God has put in them, it's derived from Adam which is God's act of creation of taken from the earth and creating and from that creation other people come and we are from God's hands we do have the breath which God has originally put which has been passed on through the generations right from God himself what does it tell us how I must treat my fellow man what does that tell me how I must treat my brother and my sister who have been made in the very image of God who in a way if you want to if you want to really be real about it God made Adam and put the DNA in Adam and put the ability for Adam to procreate throughout the ages then yeah it stands to reason that we are a continuation of that original seed which was crafted by God's hand himself. That original breath that's been carried on, you know, death cannot bear, 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 bear a child, cannot bring forth a child. It's going to be a living, breathing, living, breathing being who passes on that, that oxygen to the child which derives from God. So we're all carrying the image, the imprint of God. So which one of us then is lower than the other? Can God be lower than himself? We are all people of value. So that's the first thing. If we're carrying the name Seventh Day, that has implications how we look at other human beings and how we treat them. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 5, I believe it is, which talks about the commandments, the second giving of the commandments. When God speaks about the Sabbath, he says, Bear in mind that you were once slaves in Egypt. So the Sabbath now becomes a symbol of their independence from slavery. God bringing them out. 
So if the Sabbath is a central tenet of our faith, and it's a symbol of independence, then as Adventists, who believe in the law of God, who believe in God as creator, with that is inbuilt the message of treating your fellow man as a child, a literally a child of God. We believe in the Advent. Well, what's going to happen at the Advent? God comes, restores, makes all things new. The Advent, we associate with judgment. What does judgment imply? Justice. So the theme of justice comes. It may be a different type of justice, but nevertheless, the theme of justice comes into the whole idea. Treating people how they deserve to be treated. Because the enemy is saying they deserve to die. Jesus comes and says, Ah, but my blood shed for them on Calvary means they don't deserve to die. Think about that. When we think about systems which say these people are valueless, they can just die. But Jesus comes and says, No, they have value. The value is my life. That's a contrast of it. At the Advent, we read that Jesus will separate people and say, Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. I love etymology. Where do words come from? Our word worship translation of Barak, Shakar, Proskuneo in Greek, which means to bow down. What happens when you bow down? You're on the ground. You're at the same level. Worship doesn't mean some bow down, others are over them. It means you are all bowing down. All at the foot. All at the foot of the cross. All on the ground. While God is lifted up. So again, the whole notion of worship says that we believe everybody's on an equal plane, on an equal level. It's impossible to be a Seventh-day Adventist and not to believe in equality. Impossible. But let me take the idea a little further. God says, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto who? Done it unto me, God says. Inasmuch as you've done what? Inasmuch as you've shown worth. That person is worthy enough of you to visit them, to help them out. Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of them, you've done it unto me. When you've shown them worth, guess what? You've shown me worth. The word worship, the modern English word worship, comes from the older English word worthship, which means we give you worth. We attribute worth and value to something or somebody. So when God says, and as much as you've given worth to that person you've given worth to me in other words worship to that person worship to me or worship to that person worship to me you cannot be worshiping if you haven't shown worship to your fellow human beings that's why you see consistently god saying such things as away with your noisy music ah your noisy music where can I find that text? Amos 5.23. Thank you very much. Good. I will use that next time. We're going to have a discussion about drums in church. The Lord doesn't like noise and music. No, God doesn't like noise and music. But it sounds like noise, not because it's too loud, because you know, God's hearing capacity is, of course, not the same as human beings' capacity. He is the voice of the seven thunders, after all. God is saying... If you continue to read on in Amos, the noise of your music I cannot stand, but let what righteousness roar like a river, justice like a never ending stream. If you know a bit about Hebrew, we've been studying about this this quarter parallelism, where it says things sometimes twice using synonymous words. So, river, stream, they're both water, 
justice and righteousness guess what same thing same word you think of righteousness as being the right day i put across i uh, sorry i put away all of my bad music i am now righteous and now holy i'm now ready for translation but righteousness and justice same word in hebrew and maybe by the time we got to the greek you would thought that maybe the greeks would have separated the words out not same word justice and righteousness the same words in the greek language same words in the hebrew language which we see in our bible they're interchangeable the act of doing right right doing doing right by somebody doing the right thing not just being right and being seen as being right but doing the right thing making sure that the other person is being treated <coughs> equally and with the value, the dignity that God has given to them. So even messages of righteousness is justice. Justice by faith. Okay, righteousness. We talk about mission? Yeah, let's talk about mission. Jesus said, God has sent me to do what? Bind the brokenhearted. Declare freedom. Release prisons from darkness. Comfort those who mourn. Give beauty instead of ashes. That's the mission. That's mission. That's what we designed and required to do. God has given us this commission to go out and to do what? Preach the gospel. What does preaching the gospel mean? Well, preach the good news. What is the good news? Gospel, evangelion, a word originally used to talk about victory, you know, victory, end of a war, a new way is coming, a new leader is being installed and inaugurated so therefore, it's a new way, guys. You know, when the oppression is over or the war is over. We're now freedom. We're now victorious. That's what the word evangelion, gospel, actually means. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that Christ has come to do what? Set us free. Christ became sin for us, that we might become his righteousness, that we might have justice against the one who... in slaved us and enchained us i love galatians 5 one of my favorite texts i love the new international versions way of saying it which says it's for freedom that christ has set you free christ has set you free so you can be free and another verse says who the son has set free is is truly free he's free indeed so this whole idea of freedom freedom from sin Freedom from injustice. That's all what the gospel is about. Hey, let's talk about the three angels' messages. No problem talking about that. Some people love the sound of the three angels' messages because it sounds all lovely and adventisty. Some people are like, oh no, do we have to go this? That makes us sound too exclusive. Oh, brothers and sisters, the message there is very clear. It's a message of the supremacy of our Father, returning us to our Creator, in whose image we are made, telling us to worship Him, give Him worship, to fear Him as mankind, which means we are all on the same level. It's not telling us to fear any man, to fear God, mankind fear God. It says every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What does that tell you about equality and who is invited to the feast, the gospel feast. And then it goes on to talk about what happens when man believes the lie that the enemy told Eve and Adam in the garden that they can do what? They can be enlightened, they can be like gods, knowing good and knowing evil. In other words, you can elevate yourself, you can get this elevated status so therefore you can write the rules you can do it as you please as mankind you write the rules and what happens when mankind writes the rules when mankind born in sin shaping an iniquity conceived in sin what happens when mankind writes the rules being your influence they're going to write the rules so that hey they're at the top. What happened in Babel? Let's make ourselves quick. What happened in Babylon, the king of Babylon? 
I am the head of gold. I put myself up. What happens when you get power and position? The cases of David and his son, Solomon. What happens? Okay, you start feeling that you're powerful, you're invincible. You can have whatever you want, do whatever you want. Fix things up to make yourself look good. Get upset when the prophet Nathan comes to you and tells you about somebody's sheep and threatens to take that person out before he's saying, you are that person, David. That's what happens with mankind. Mankind creates these levels of putting themselves at the top. Racism can never happen in the paradigm of creation. It is exclusive to the paradigm of evolution. Let me say it again. When you believe in creationism, believe in creating in the image of God, that cannot lead to racism. Racism requires the trajectory painted by evolution. That's its root. That's where people were saying people are of different levels the same because they haven't evolved yet to that level. You couldn't use creation and say they weren't created to be that way. Not possible. It has to use an evolutionary paradigm. So don't go telling people that you're teaching them about the Sabbath and teaching them about creationism if there's that level in your head which doesn't tie in with what creationism really means. Don't tell people you're talking about judgment if you don't believe in justice, which is connected with judgment. You can talk to people about three angels' messages when you're actually encouraging people to have a Babylonian mindset. What is a Babylonian mindset? I'm great. I can do things. I can change. God's lords. Okay, you can follow me rather than follow God. Elevation of self. That's at the heart of it. That's at the heart of it. So it's no point with telling people, you know, be careful when Sunday law comes, etc., etc., etc. If we're not actually putting into practice everything that would prepare us for such a law, can you see how a message, a Seventh-day Adventist message, it has at its root, its principles, its spiritual principles, its spiritual foundations, are about the Father, the Creator, the God who has created us, created us in His image, the restoration of the image of God in mankind, which the devil is trying to take away that value from mankind. Which side does racism represent? The restoration of God's image or the taking away? The devaluing of a person? Which side does it represent? Humility before God, or being pompous and elevating oneself and one's status above somebody else? Does it represent creating in God's image, or does it represent, well, you've evolved at different levels and different strata, or you're not quite fully developed yet? Does it represent mission when the whole idea of gospel when Jesus said this is what I've come to do to not just sit here and preach to people but to say this is a year of God's favour and this is my mission to free people can we talk about righteousness by any means by faith there's no, no such thing as righteousness by works but can we talk about righteousness if we don't understand that the synonym or the same word for righteousness in both Old and New Testament both Hebrew and Greek are the same for righteousness and justice can we even talk about stewardship without talking about justice 
Can we even talk about inspiration of prophecy, the prophetic gift, without talking about justice? Why did God raise up prophets very often to talk about the injustices at the time? Read Isaiah chapter 1, 58, 59. And see how many times that word justice comes up and oppressed comes up. And how God's saying, you guys are worshipping me. You think you've got the correct worship style. And you think because of your teachings and who you are, you are correct. So you are exempt from following the rules. You are immune from any kind of judgment because you've got the truth. God says, I will not accept your worship. I will not accept your fasting. I won't accept your, your so-called shepherds. I won't even accept your offerings. Look at the book of Malachi. I won't accept your singing. I won't accept anything that you're bringing that you say is worship or righteousness or whatever before me whilst injustice is going on. Jesus spoke against injustice. Hey, the Sabbath, healing a man with a withered arm. There's six days to do that, Jesus said. Yep, there are six days to do that, but there's also a seventh day. It's the best day to do it on because I'm about to set this man free. Sabbath is a symbol of freedom. Because guess what? If your animal was trapped, guess what you do to your animal? Would you let your, and your animal remain trapped? Or would you set it free? So I'm going to do what you would do to an animal, but to a human being created in God's image. I'm going to set him free. And Jesus often spoke about people with afflictions being bound by Satan. The Satan was abandoning them with that affliction and he's, he had to set them free from that affliction. But hey, people didn't want to have anyone to set them. And Jesus is saying, hey, Sabbath is a day to celebrate independence from oppression. Whether it's physical oppression, health oppression, spiritual oppression, that becomes a symbol of righteousness and what I've done, the finished work of creation, that we can rest. Why can we rest? Because when nobody's pressing us, we can we can rest and relax in, in God. So Seventh-day Adventism, when applied to real-life situations, when it's relevant to what's going on on the street, doesn't spend its time in trying to track everything the Pope does, every movement, every mile he goes. It's like he's some private detective following his car and listening to every single word that he says and trying to analyse it. We must be mindful of the times, absolutely, but there's a bigger work we've got to do out there. A bigger, bigger, more important work we've got to do out there in ensuring that this world is changed, is impacted, because people who say that they believe in a God who's coming again, who say that they believe in a God of the Sabbath, who say that they believe in a God who is a God of righteousness and requires righteousness of us, who say they believe in the mission, who say they believe in evangelism, who say they believe in every nation, kindred, tongue, people, who say they need to call out Babylon and call out against the very idea of elevating yourself. If we believe that, then that needs to translate itself in us being at the forefront and not afraid to speak out against injustices. So it's my Adventism, my love for Adventism, the Adventist doctrine, which has driven me to actually say there are certain things we've put across on the pulpit across the years which have been purposely denigrating to different cultures. And if you really want to be true Adventists, truly representative of God's purpose and mission for us in this world to make a difference, to proclaim his return and prepare people for that because we love them, not because we have a better education than them of the word of God, so we need to let them know, you know, this is the truth. You follow it, now you've got the truth. Right, get baptized. Right, ready for the kingdom. No, no, no. 
no, 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 God's kingdom isn't, it's not a university, you know, it's not an academy. I'm not preparing people for graduation, a graduation gown and a certificate, you know, all this stuff. I'm preparing a people for God's way, for God's mentality, which is a family, which is a freedom, freedom from the enemy, love, togetherness, power, his spirit. Maranatha, God bless you.